This week on Theater Talk, I'm going to uh, follow just that show to every corner of the globe with my <laughs> club that's my column. The fact of the matter is... And you'll make it more money. <laughs> so my question to you is, how much did you invest? <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, the spring season is opening, and it is jam-packed. Yes, but first, in the matter of Spider-Man, oh. turn off the dark. <laughs> we can't start a show without talking about the show that everybody, indeed, in New York, in fact, around the country, is talking about. So we're here to analyze the situation with this colossal train wreck. We have with us Michael Musto of The Village Voice. You're not biased at all, are you? <laughs> <laughs> not a loaded intro. I just want to say to everybody in Spider-Man, break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> cute, cute. We have, Ju <laughs> we have Julie Tamor's acolyte, Jesse Green of New York Magazine, who wrote this incredible puff piece about Julie Tamor on the eve of this train wreck, Jesse. Your point? <laughs> Puff piece. <laughs> That's why she loves me so much? Uh, oh, does she hate you because of that piece? I have no idea. Did you hear from her? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm very hurt. And also in the tank for Tamor for many years. <laughs> Go get him, Spider-Man. <laughs> Tiger, Patrick Pacheco from New York One, the LA Times, and the uh, author of the movie Waking Sleeping Beauty. All right, let's destroy Spider-Man while I've got you all here. Um, all right, Jesse, $65 million, now $70 million show, directed by Julie Tamor. You spent a lot of time with Julie Tamor for that New York Magazine piece. Where has she gone wrong? Why is this thing out of control? And it's her fault, is it not? <laughs> I don't know him. <laughs> oh, the leading question. <laughs> wow, can I, can I answer the question about cats or something? <laughs> I, no, I'm putting you on the spot. You're the only one of us who spent a lot of time with her in rehearsal. Because, what were you picking okay, up Okay, because art is difficult. If, if The real answer to You be call Spider-Man art a well, cartoon musical? It could be. I'm not prejudging. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know you. that's your business, but <laughs> my business is to let an artist try to do what they're doing. Maybe it'll fail. Maybe it's terrible. But she's done wonderful stuff in the past, both commercially successful and, you know, artistically successful. And I'm of the mind, let her try, and if need be, let her fail. What's it to me how much it costs? When you were spending all that time with her, with all that access you got... Did you have any sense this thing is going to get into the kind of trouble that it's gotten into? Well, the problem was I had a lot of access, but I was on wires 40 feet above her <laughs> at all times, so I really couldn't tell. No, it looked like a show that needed a lot of work. Honestly, yes, it did, but i that's why they have money. Mm. Patrick, um, I mean, I'm going to lay this at the doorstep of Julie Tamor. I think she's out of control. I think there is no mm -hmm. strong producer <clears throat> running this show. I think that's why there have been these injuries. I think she's the type of person who, to quote from your piece in New York Magazine, you had a producer anonymously who said she's the most selfish rich kid I've ever met. Her lack of compassion is astounding. Is that what we're up against, one of these mad directors who will just throw those actors into anything? <laughs> no. I don't, think, I don't think that's what we're... I don't know what we're up against. The thing about it is, is that you... I agree with Jesse. you got to give artists time to time. lay it's out their vision. Fourth, fourth postponement uh, of the opening night. I th time. Uh, uh, Funny Girl had five uh, <laughs> postponements yeah, yeah, of yeah. openings. It's not unusual to have a postponement. As uh, Jesse said, it's an incredibly difficult show. And technically, it's a monster. That's for sure. Is that Julie Taymor's fault? And again, it's $65 million. Are we really worried about you know, rich people losing $65 million of their dollars? I think it was a smart commercial move to delay uh, and postpone until March 15th. Absolutely. Whether the critics or come or not, they're not worried about that. The mem out there already is that it's open and the critics have already trashed it. I trashed it on the first preview because it's really lousy. It is inept. Storytelling's inept. First preview. The music is inept. The whole thing is inept. Per first preview is the operative word there. You got to give people I've gone time. back to see it and it got more inept on the second preview. You that saw it in the first preview and you saw it the night after the guy smashed his head, uh, smashed his spine. So that's not really seeing it when they're all relaxed and <laughs> Michael, you want to jump in here? I mean, help me out. These people are totally in 
the tank for this big gargantuan <laughs> commercial train wreck. They're basically calling it snuff theater. <laughs> uh, people are showing up to watch people die, hopefully yeah. not on their own heads. Uh, the most poignant moment for me was when the woman who got the concussion tweeted, let's all pray for the guy who smashed his ribs. <laughs> um, they're both out of the show now. Unfortunately, the shoe number is still in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is this terrible number for this character called Arachne, who's Julie Taymor's stand-in, this woman who manipulates the whole thing. This is and your interpretation. No, no. Yeah. The, the character rises above and says at one point, I'm the only artist working in the world today. If that's not Julie Taymor's megalomania, I don't know what is. Well, I'm not pinning all the bad stuff happening on Julie Taymor. She's a proven entity. Uh, but some people are complaining about the fact that after you get over the wizardry, which is in the first five minutes, right? Ooh, ah, Cirque du Soleil. Uh, then it becomes more of a yawn as it goes on, and the book and the score need work. That's what previews are for. However, this show is going to have, obviously, the longest gestation period in history. I think Nick and Nora, remember that yeah. one? Yeah. Had 71 previews. <clears throat> this is obviously going to go near the 100 mark if it even opens on March 15th. The eyes Critics are going to start sneaking in. They already have and have yeah. written sort of half-assed semi-reviews. Right. Yeah. I don't want to sneak in because I don't want to see it twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on this subject of the now the third postponement for opening night, officially f fourth, I guess, yeah. whatever, who knows. Do you think the critics are going to wait until March 15th or the review is going to start to come out sooner rather than later? I, I doubt the critics will wait again, uh, and that may be part of the strategy. I think yeah. it is. I think it is. I think the strategy is let the critics come and the reviews dribble out higgly piggly. That way we don't face one day of an avalanche of bad reviews. And remember Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, the musical, did great business in previews. Everybody thought it was a must-see. The reviews came out. No business. Right. Uh, I don't think Spider-Man's going to be the same story. I think it's more critic-proof. I think it's an event show that tourists are going to want to see. And kids They like don't it. read the New York Times, those people. Right. I, I don't want to lay this completely on Julie Taymor, only because you take any artist and you say, you're a great genius, here's all the money you want, do whatever you want. That invariably goes wrong. But the thing is, I do look at how they're advertising this thing on television and in taxi cabs and say, now open on Broadway, and not saying it's previews. I, I question the ethics of that. I think it's a smart move uh, to it, let the critics come and let them come again because they're probably going to come now and then they're going to come after it opens as well to see whatever the changes are. I think word of mouth on the street right now is mixed Terrible. about. Poisonous. Mixed. Poisonous. Mixed. It's mixed. Poisonous. It's, it's mixed. <laughs> if he has any Sorry, way, Michael. <laughs> no, Michael, I've heard from people it's, who, who are connected totally to children, and they say, oh, the kids, the kids love it, the yeah. kids will love it. And that's what's going to... Yeah, if somebody falls on their head. That's where they don't have any margin for error. Another accident. None. No, no. But that can I would just really ask, Michael, you, you keep saying we're in the tank and puff piece, which <laughs> that quote does not exactly sound like a puff piece. Buried, no. buried, <laughs> buried. That should have been your lead. But yeah. it's reasonable for you to ask me that question. But seriously, why are you so obsessed with, with this show? Yes, why are you up against it? Listen, it's uh, slow time on Broadway, and i got to fill two <laughs> There we go. And this, has right. been, this has been <laughs> okay. a, a boon. great, great holiday present. <laughs> An now, honest answer. I have to say, honestly, I mean, I have no compunction about reviewing the show. I've seen it twice. The show is inept at this point. It is inept. I'm sorry. That's what all the chat boards are saying. I think. Oh, I think oh I think, there you go. Oh, there you go. Well, but, but it uh, seems so uh, obvious, Patrick, Michael. you've seen the show. Honestly, you've seen the show. What did you think? I thought that it had a lot of work to do. <laughs> but I didn't think it was inept. Not at all. Inept. That second act where you have no idea what's going on? Well, as I said, I think the book had a lot of problems. <laughs> but I saw the second preview, Michael. You've got to give people... But, I, but it's no I, haven't, work. I haven't even seen the show, and I know from the word out there. The shoe number is obviously <laughs> the worst thing since the garlic number in Dance of the Vampires, which I loved. Uh, and it needs a stronger ending. Julie Taymor is acknowledging we need to fix the ending because it just kind of ends. But what about the other problems? This is like uh, a plane has lost three of its four engines and you're going to fix the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fix the fundamental problem of the structure of the show and get some melodies in there. Yeah, the music is... Boring. I say just make it a U2 jukebox show. Why not raid their <laughs> hit parade and put In the Name of Love and New Year's Day in there with new lyrics about Spider-Man? Who's going to care? It'd be great. At the point of being repetitious, but does no one take my point that invariably when you give somebody a whole lot of money and say, you're a great genius, I don't know, you've try never me. written a <laughs> I don't think I'll run it into the ground. Right, but, but all right, well, let's, well, let's how could she resist? Well, but all right, Susan raised this point, and you and you because you spent a lot of time with this team. What did you make of Michael Cole, who is now the official lead producer? Does he know what he's doing in the theater on Broadway? Clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> then why ask the question? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> not. 
look, I have a different goal <laughs> when I'm writing than you do. <laughs> I'm trying to understand personality and what drives people. And, you know, I like the guy, and I thought he was enabling, and that word has a double A, <laughs> uh, someone who sometimes produces <clears throat> works of genius. That is really my bottom line. I'm not just saying that because I'm in the tank. I did think that it, there was a tremendous amount of work to be done for it to be something that I would care about. But, I, you know, there's tons of shows that aren't for me. Yeah. That's all right with me. I don't care. And when she did Spider-Man, you adored her. No, no, no. Uh, you mean Lion King. <laughs> Let me say that again. And when she... <laughs> Take two. And An when actor she, fell on Susan's yes, head. Right. Long ago. What? And when she, when said, a Natalie Mendoza moment, she got hit with the wire she, to <laughs> And when she did, oh, oh, oh. Lion King. When she did Lion King. You loved yes, her. Yes, but I turn on people <laughs> so <Yeah>. fast. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's so so goblin. No, I mean, I honestly, I mean, we're, we're just going to, I'm going to beat this thing into the ground. Yep. But the fact of the matter is, I was appalled. $65 million <laughs> spent on this big nothing. Hey, the Why Book of Mormon. Oh. And on top of which, I think the jury is out whether this will be a hit or not a hit. Do you think it can overcome all the publicity, very probably negative reviews, and become a critic-proof commercial success? I think it can. Michael? I think it will overcome the reviews and will run longer than anyone thinks. I don't think it will earn its money back. I think it can. I think it will be branded. It will run long enough to be branded, whether it makes its money back or not. And then it will spread all over the world, Michael. And you can take your animus all over. You can make your animus global. <laughs> I'm going to follow just local. that show to every corner of the globe with my <laughs> club that's my column. The fact of the matter is... And you'll make it more money. <laughs> so my question to you is, how much did you invest? <laughs> Do I look like a sucker to you, my friend? No. Oh, you look the, smart the, to me. The, the issue issue here is their plan is because it's just simply too expensive to really make a profit on Broadway mm. and their plan has always been to play these 10,000 seat arenas I don't think you're ever going to see that I don't think they'll be able to get 10,000 people to go to see this thing unless Bono and the Edge are starring as Mary Jane or, gr or Green are. Day <laughs> but how could they engineer that they'd be dropping people on their heads all over the world that's the plan yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right moving right along um, another show that people are beginning to buzz about is the, um, Book, of the Book of Mormon created yeah. by the South Park guys. Now, once again, uh, you've had access <clears throat> to it already or you're about to get a lot of access for a New York Magazine story. Well, you seem to know no more about my schedule than <laughs> I do. I, I'll have to ask my editor about that. Yeah. What is your sense, though, about it? I mean, you've... Everything I've heard about it is that it's fantastic and hilarious, and I think it's uh, a good bet to be the hit of the spring. Mm. Michael, your sense of uh, the Book of Mormon? Agreed, and it, it's irreverent, and it's probably going to start controversy because the, the marquee says God's favorite musical. <laughs> and, uh, but, of course, we don't know if it's Ben Brantley's favorite musical. That's more important. <laughs> but um, I, I like the irreverence. I think it could be the new Spamalot and definitely the best Mormon musical since Donnie and Marie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How big is the audience for it, though? Do well, you think? I think that's, the, that's the, the difficult question to answer at this point, because it is the dirtiest musical in many ways, right? I mean, there's, it's an old hose barred South Park Well, it's not as, it's not as so not out there as South Park itself. But you're not going to bring the kids to it, right? Oh, and you'd bring your teenagers. I would absolutely bring mine. They'll laugh their asses off. Yeah. There you go. So <laughs> I, will it get the theater-going audience? Will it get an audience that can pay 130 bucks a ticket? I think that's what might be in the balance here it's for its success. Yeah, it's an interesting question Merchant though. Success. It's often debated now, if, <clears throat> can you move beyond that very traditional, middle age, not so hip theater audience and really run that long? Do you still think you, you, think you still need that core, old fashioned theater party ladies coming in? No, you don't need that and if you do, th that's running out, as, as we've said. But there are, there are people, producers are experimenting with other ways to f fill the blanks. Look at Rock of Ages. There, there's that. There's a nostalgia. The baby boomer nostalgia yeah. is one possibility. There's, um, you know, with with uh, American Idiot, they've they've found a way using the actual Green Day star to revive that show's fortunes immensely. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that with every show, but there has to be there has to be something. And th it could well be that in this case, the TV connection with South Park would be enough to do it. But I think it is going to be somewhat review dependent. You know, a lot of these shows that <coughs> the critics have proclaimed <coughs> as being really hit, Michael. In fact, haven't really taken off or caught on. 
No, and a lot of them are shows that should have stayed off Broadway. And I hate to say that because we're always complaining that Broadway is so safe. It's all revivals, museum pieces, and jukebox shows. I and admire the <laughs> I admire <laughs> the people out there who say let's take a chance and throw Bloody Andrew Jackson or Scottsboro Boys on Broadway, even though it probably won't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone said Andrew Jackson was too dumb and juvenile. I thought it was too smart for the the tourist crowd. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, a musical about you know appropriation of rights and history and done in a kind of Harvard pudding club kind of way. You're acting like this is some new phenomenon that's so cutting edge. South Park has been on TV a long time, mm -hmm. as long as Green Day has been around. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they can appeal to a crowd outside of the blue-haired matinee ladies who've died anyway. They don't exist. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's the price of the ticket uh, and, and the irreverence. I think it is cutting edge in terms of how far it pushes. Uh, we have a lot of stars. There's, in fact, a pileup <laughs> of stars. We have uh, Chris Rock and uh -huh. Mother Bleep Bleep with the hat. Uh, Robin, Robin, Williams. Williams. Robin Williams and a Ben Bengal tiger at the Baghdad Zoo. Ghetto clown. I don't know what that is. Uh, That's John Leguizamo. <laughs> John John Leguizamo <laughs> in ghetto, ghetto clown. Ben Stiller. Uh, ben, Stiller ben Stiller in and Edie Falco. In Edie Falco. Francis House. McDormand and Good People. Do we have a potential pileup of stars, and do they cannibalize each I other? Thank or? you for Sutherland in that championship. That's season. right. Yeah. Well, that that would be a great other? show. <laughs> the pileup of the stars cannibalizing <laughs> each other. Right? I think you could sell 175 dollar tickets. For that. <laughs> That's right. But I mean, do they? Is there an audience big enough to support all of these stars? I haven't seen this many stars in one season ever, really. Yeah, I think it's. I think when it ever comes to stars, it it's. Do people want to see that star in that show? Uh, is what it often comes down to. So the question mark here is, do people want to see Daniel Radcliffe in How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying? I think that'll be the litmus test on that score. I think people like Robin Williams and Chris Rock will actually sell out just because the, it's their Broadway, respective Broadway debuts. We haven't seen them before on Broadway. It's interesting, though, they're both taking secondary roles. Yeah. In, in the, in but that's a very clever <laughs> movie yes, star it, thing to do. It is. So that way you don't carry the play. Right. And if it fails, you Can't don't... Can't be blamed. Yeah. You, and you the know, tiger actually narrates. I, I did my research. This <laughs> is for real. And I'm paging Julie Taymor. <laughs> <laughs> we need a talking tiger. <laughs> <laughs> that won't hurt anybody. <laughs> this is in the, the Bengal Tiger. At yes, the, yes. The, the Baghdad. But I don't think it's a problem that there are too many stars on Broadway. Let's just enjoy the, their sense, provenance. Do, what's, behind, what's behind this uh, um, uh, rush of stars to Broadway? Do you know? Failing careers. <laughs> <laughs> Combination of colliding careers with the rising ticket costs and the fact that you need a star to attract people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I'm hearing, too, in Hollywood that uh, stars aren't getting the, the quotes that they used to get for the movies. And unless you're in a franchise movie these days, there's not a lot of activity for stars who are, who are aging. And so, therefore, you take a 97% cut in income <laughs> <laughs> to work your ass. So off there I go again with the language <laughs> for 16 weeks. It, it, you, I think there's more people who love theater. Yes. Yeah. Denzel Washington last year, yeah, all right, you don't make nearly as much money doing a Broadway show. But when you get, you know, a huge rave review from the New York Times, it, it adds something to your career, does it not? It, well, I think ego, certainly. If you win a Tony, I don't think that, that appearing on Broadway necessarily affects your career one, in film one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a sm much smaller world. You know, you often say this about your friend Scott Rudin. Is who's that producing a lot of these who's plays. Who's producing right? a lot of the plays. But, I mean, he's a big producer in Hollywood, but he's one of many big producers in Hollywood. Here, he, his profile is much larger, and I think that applies to stars as well. Yeah, I would say on the subject... It's a smaller pond. I think, actually, Scott Rudin is a is a reason why these stars are coming because they they all respect him. They've all worked with him in movies. He's a committed theater man and he just has the ability to pick up the phone and get these guys to come to do well. Well, he, he does have good taste in material. Mm. And whether or not they're all gonna be hits is one question, but they're pretty much all things that I wanna see. Um, um, what about Jerusalem with uh, Mark Rylance? What's that about? Mm. Well, the play is, a, what the, the, is about it, it doesn't sound very Broadway, frankly, but then neither did Labette, and look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it big, I think that did win the Olivier. Um, Bomb it, on Broadway. Uh, it, uh, it's about a you know, British guy who's sort of the, the town ne'er-do-well who lives in an in a RV caravan in the woods and basically everyone hates. Oh, there you go. So well, no, I are. saw the play in London, and it's a very oh. interesting play. I think it's going to have a struggle here. It's... it's very, very, it's English. It deals with very specifically about the English working class white trash, which is different from America's 
working class. Do they go to the theater? <laughs> is that how they're different? And what he is, he's, he's the town drug dealer, basically. Mm. And he's, of course, hated by the bourgeois people in the right. town, but loved by all the kids in the town. Right. What yeah. would be the thinking behind putting money into something like Jerusalem, which sounds intriguing to me, but it doesn't sound like it would sell tickets unless it was a massive snob hit that Ben Brantley loved? Well, well, Ben Brantley did love reason. it. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank ben, you. Now, what about I'm glad what, you're up on all the stuff about, going on? With no, Brantley I, loved it, and and when you know Brantley gave it a rave review in London, and there, so you oh, have a lot of London producers. There is have a room rave in the for a prestige coming. hit mm -hmm. now and then. Could, there is. Could Warhorse be a prestige hit? No, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Oh, that's prestige hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they're really hoping for over at Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Prestige hit, 16 weeks. I think uh, this is the biggest drag season I think in history. Cherry Jones and Mrs. Warren's. No, no, <laughs> no Harvey Firestein's going into Lacage. Oh, right. Uh, uh -huh. As you say, the, the chorus of Spider Man are all drag queens. Brian yeah. Bedford. Um, Brian Bedford. <laughs> Uh, Priscilla, Bedford. Brian Bedford. Bedford. Brian Bedford yeah. as uh, as Lady Bracknell uh, in in the importance of being earnest. Yeah. Uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, though. I mean, is this got a Mamma Mia type uh, audience? Yeah, I think it's going to be a hit, and I and I think it's going to overshadow the other eight musicals that are opening this uh, this spring. Have well, you seen it or heard it? Ones. I did. I saw it in London, ah. and it's just great fun. It's but really they couldn't get the, Ab the They didn't get the ABBA songs because they're tied up in Mamma Mia, so it's yeah. like other kind of disco-y songs. It is, yeah. It's like I Will Survive and MacArthur Park and... Ooh, how do I get tickets? <laughs> 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 this is right up my little Tim Pan alley. But, but what it does have is the spectacle of the costumes that are witty and fun. With, with Nick Adams, you don't want costumes. <laughs> <laughs> that man has well, serious abs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he probably strips down. But it was a, the Toronto probably, critics Probably, like liked he doesn't it. remember. <laughs> I, I saw Priscilla Queen of the oh. Desert in Australia, and I thought it was a big bloated Vegas show. I didn't think it was. Well, a it's not for you though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're what quaking is for you, in their Michael? boots, Michael. <laughs> Michael doesn't see anything. They're quaking in their boots. The producers of Priscilla and the producers of Spider Man are just freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> is there, Jesse? I mean, anything? Well, we touched on some of the plays. I mean, something of quality that is not going to be a tourist-driven show, I, and, and without a star that we should be looking uh, for. I, I think Catch Me If You Can is going to be very good. You saw? Didn't you go out to see it in Seattle? Sure, if you say so. <laughs> um, the team is, you know, mm -hmm. Scott about Whitman. the best team there is working on it, and the material is fantastic. It's Scott Whitman and Mark Shaman who mm -hmm. wrote and, Hairspray, and, Jack O'Brien, Jack O'Brien, and and all of those folks, and and. Uh, you know, I, we've all heard bits of the score. It's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. fun. And um, the, although the names uh, uh, attached to the show are not Hollywood names, they're excellent theater names. So I, I have high hopes for that. Could it be uh, the show that kind of is the one that the the core theater people, i.e., the Tony voters, kind of rally around because it's going to be a, a a sophisticated but more traditional kind of Broadway yeah. musical. Not being a member of that organization anymore. That yes, anymore. <laughs> I have no opinion on it. <laughs> Youth, what, what's your take on Catch Me? Um, again, great team, and I think it'll be between that and uh, Book of Mormon, probably for best musical. Hmm. Considering the other crapola that's opening, I wonder but. if we could get into a situation where we've had before, where when it comes to the Tony Awards, you have the that contingent of road voters who say, you know, what we really can't sell the South Park musical hmm. here in Cleveland, mm -hmm. but we can sell Catch Me. Do you think this could come into play? As it seems to more and more every season, Patrick. Definitely, I think that Catch Me If You Can is the is the show to beat for the best musical Tony, hmm. uh, and I think that'll play into it. I think it was arguable that had the media still been voters last year, Fela would have won over Memphis. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that absolutely uh, had something to do with it. But I think Catch Me If You Can, and I don't, haven't seen Book of Mormon, nor, nor Catch Me If You Can, but I think they're probably really promising uh, as both commercial and critical hits. I still send in my ballot. I don't care if they count. <laughs> <laughs> All right, For, a force, force, <laughs> we gotta wrap it up, right? Yeah, yeah. Force prediction. How many Tony nominations does Spider-Man turn off the dark git? For which year? <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, come on. That's how I'm getting out of that one. <laughs> how many Tony nominations? Uh, it's definitely going to get scenic design and costumes, and I will say two. <laughs> <laughs> five. Four. Four? Yeah, no, I mean, five. Five. What are, what are they for? What are they for? <laughs> Julie Taymor? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, certainly sets and costumes. And Julie Taymor. It depends. <laughs> I mean, there'll be actually 12 new musicals buying for those four I slots. think there's a new category so, for EMS work. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Julie Taymor's going to get the, the actor's fund. Uh. <laughs>
<laughs> special prize. I think it's going to get two, year. don't you? I think it isn't going to get a single, single one. one. Oh. I think it is going to be despised <laughs> oh. by the theater community, and it will not have a single award, and I do not think Spider-Man will be running a year from now. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Jesse Green from New York Magazine, close friend of Julie Taymor's. <laughs> we haven't spoken once since that article came out. <laughs> That's because she, like me, saw that quote, the most spoiled rich kid I've ever met, and all that blather was undercut by that quote. I should have just said that it was from you. <laughs> My quotes in there were uh, on the record. Yes, they were. I'm not a friend. Thank I'm not you for an that. Anonymous poster, for God's sake. <laughs> um, <laughs> Michael Musto from the Village Voice. Voice of Reason. Thank you. <laughs> and Patrick Pacheco from New York One on stage, the LA Times, and look for uh, Waking Sleeping Beauty in um, uh, uh, DVDs now. Yep, and it's on Netflix. All right, I'll see you guys at the opening of Spider Man: Turn Off the Dark <laughs> <laughs> on the Ides so, of March. And before we go, I just want to remember Ellen Stewart, who was the founder of the La Mama Experimental Theater. She was a great woman. She had a great life, and I worked for her. Yeah. And, and, and Michael, uh, with The Village Voice, uh, you covered a lot of her shows. You, yes, she what basically was created Off Off Broadway mm -hmm. at La Mama, and uh, she lived and breathed theater. She launched an amazing amount of careers. Right. You know, she touched a lot of artists' lives. So, Ellen, if you can hear us, thank you very much again. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.